enjoy this man's work immensely. He's outstanding at what he does. Uh, we'll ask in the poll question, but right now, uh, what's on everybody's minds is Conor McGregor. Is he the new Brett Favre of uh, of the sports world? A third retirement for Conor McGregor in the weekend in which UFC uh, hit 250. Uh, Ariel Hawani of the Worldwide Leader in Sports here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, sir? Hello, Rich and friends. How are you? I got so excited for a second because I thought Josh Gad was actually like going to do the show with me right now, and ah. I almost freaked out. No, but, he'll be on um, shortly. Now, you have children, though, Ariel, correct? Yes. How yes, old, how old are you? three children. Okay, so that's why you've seen – how many times have you seen Frozen? <laughs> so my daughter is the youngest. She's three, yes. and so you can imagine that oh we gosh. probably watch it, al- I mean, almost nightly at this point, uh, especially with Disney Plus and all the different iterations oh, and whatnot. So if I – like, my. I was thinking – I would get to go tell my daughter right now that I spoke to Olaf. She would freak out, but alas, not happening. Well, how about uh, the fact that you would speak to a 54-year-old man with no children who's a diehard Olaf fan and Mike Del Tufo? Would that count for your child? <laughs> for, well, honestly, for me, this is way cooler. I mean, I've already told you about what you mean to me and, and, and uh, the inspiration that you were in my career. So this is cool. But being the dad that I am, you know, yes. Father's Day coming up, I, I felt like I could uh, give them that. That, I mean, great booking on your part. That's a phenomenal booking right there. He's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm jealous of the booking, to be honest, because he's a oh, very busy man. Oh, you know, I'm dude. just being honest. I was a little excited for a moment. So, Ariel Hawani, um, oh, is Conor McGregor the new Brett Favre of sports? <laughs> what do you think? Well, okay, so I said this to a team, and I spoke to him on Saturday after the tweet. So he's done this now three times where he tweets that he's retired. And his timing isn't great on this one because it happens – literally, you know, minutes after UFC 250. So people were annoyed because they felt like he was taking some shine away from Amanda Nunez. But unlike the first two times, this time he actually elaborated. And I think that, and and it's okay, it's it's understandable. I think that people are distracted by the R word here and aren't really listening to what he is saying or digesting properly what he is saying. And what he told me was he's very frustrated. He wants to fight. You know, he had a very difficult 2019. He was... uh, you know, very confident in the fact that he would fight at least three times this year, which is music to the UFC's ears, because, you know, when he fights, it's a huge financial success for them. And he's like, I'm ready to go. Like, get me a fight. I'm ready to go. I want to fight. Stop trying to ice me. You know, pandemic, no gate, no fans, no opponent. Like, I want to fight. You guys are putting on fights. I want to fight. And so he's basically throwing up his hands and says, all right, I'm, I'm tired of this. This has taken away all the fun. I'm not happy anymore. And so do I think he will fight again? Yes. I asked him in January after the second time that he retired. He's like, of course, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight till I'm 50. I'm going to fight till my son is fighting on the same cards as me, and I'm going to be fighting in the co-main event in his main event fight. So <laughs> I think we'll see him. I just think he's very frustrated right now. So how has his message been received by Dana White and the uh, powers that be then? So Dana's reaction to the message, because he found out about it while he was doing the post-flight media rounds on Saturday, was like, hey, all my guys are acting crazy right now because of the pandemic. And and that's kind of his take on it, but I don't know if that's the most accurate take, if I'm being honest. There is a larger story here. Uh, The story is that some of the biggest stars in the UFC are openly feuding with the company. Now, all their reasons aren't the same. Money is kind of the common denominator when it comes to all these stories. But you've got Henry Cejudo, who just walked away as bantamweight champion because he wasn't happy with how much he was getting paid. You've got John Jones, who's openly saying, right. please release me so I can go fight elsewhere. You've got Jorge Masvidal, who's saying the same and talking about the discrepancies in, in the revenue share agreement that they have with the fighters. And then you have Connor saying what he said on Saturday. So this isn't a, a good look for the UFC, and they should probably try to figure it out before I think it becomes a bigger deal and more fighters start to speak out. Aurel Hawani, uh, ESPN MMA uh, expert, journalist, right here on the Rich Eisen Show. So what's the fix? You must you must have an idea about what the fix might be or what the players are, I mean, what the fighters are looking for, Ariel. So, yeah, so, you know, it's an interesting thing because we're, it's easy to lump all the guys together and say there's unrest, right? There's a revolt going on, but really all their gripes are different, right? And there's different fixes for each and every one of their gripes. Now, I will also say that historically when fighters have spoken up about being unhappy, because this isn't a new thing, you know, famously it really started in 2007 when Randy Couture wanted to fight a guy named Fyodor Emelianenko, and he actually teamed up with Mark Cuban to try and make this happen, but the UFC had a contract with him. But what happens is, and it happened with Couture, eventually they come to terms, 
that fighter is relatively happy, he stays quiet, and the issue goes away. I'm wondering, does someone break through here? Does someone actually say, you know what, enough is enough. It's not just about making me happy. It's about helping everyone else that's coming up. That remains to be seen. I don't know if anyone really has that in their heart. So with Cejudo, I think Cejudo will come back eventually. I mean, even today, he's talking to TMZ about fighting the 145 champion. So does Cejudo want, I mean, he's handled the whole thing incorrectly from the get-go. He retires in the cage, and then literally 10 minutes later at the post-fight press conference, he goes, well, they know my number. So, like, okay, no one believes you that you're retiring anyway. <laughs> John Jones' situation, you know, I would love to see him go up to heavyweight finally and fight Francis Ngannou. He wants more money. What they need to do is sit down and actually talk. They're not even talking. They're going back and forth on Twitter and text messages, and they're not even talking and negotiating properly like actual adults. So they need to sit down and talk and figure this out from a, you know, a financial standpoint that helps both sides. The, the Masvidal one, to me, is the most interesting because he was paid X amount to fight Nate Diaz at Madison Square Garden in, in uh, November, and now they're offering him less to fight the actual real champion at 170, and he's like, how does that make sense? So that, to me, is the one that seems like they're the most far apart. And then, Connor, you have a situation where you just need to get the guy a fight. Like, get the guy a fight. Yes, no one is in attendance. Yes, there's no gate, no fans, all that. But the pay-per-view will kill, especially if you do it in July when there's no sports yet. To me, it makes a lot of sense to try to, you know, get him back in there. At the end of the day, what they need to do is start talking to these guys, listening to them, and not take everything so personally where they say, all right, you're not going to fight, we're going to the next guy. Because who hurts in that situation the most, I think it's the fans because you're not getting the best fighters to fight, and that's what the fans want to see. Who should Connor fight? Who would you suggest? Well, I would love to see him fight Justin Gaethje, and they're saying Gaethje is going to fight Khabib Nurmagomedov, who's the champion at 155, and that's a great fight, but Khabib's only ready in September. And if Gaethje doesn't want to fight Connor and thinks like, hey, it's, it's in my best interest to wait, then okay, fine, that's his prerogative. But what they're telling Connor is, just wait for the winner of that fight. And Connor's saying hey, you know, I'm ready to go. You have the biggest star in the history of the sport, the biggest star ready to go. Don't tell me to wait till December, January when that guy is ready. Like, figure something out. So, all right, if it's not Gaethje, put him off to the side. I would love to do the Diaz trilogy fight. That's the easiest one to sell. I mean, could you imagine those two guys fighting in an empty arena and right. they're trash talking and they're hitting <laughs> each other? It's great theater. Right. I'd love to see that happen. So, do that, but they haven't talked to Diaz yet for some strange reason. And if not Diaz, if you're not going to give Masvidal the title fight, then do Masvidal versus Connor because I think that would be a massive fight as well. It sure would. Um, I'll give you the floor on Amanda Nunes. Uh, you said that she, she's she been uh, overshadowed. Let's give her her due. I mean, the GOAT, right? Correct? Ariel? Yes. 100%. When it comes to women's MMA, 100%. Uh, she is the greatest ever. She is the most accomplished. The gap between her and the rest of the competitors at 145 and 135, where she competes in both weight classes, is just incredibly wide right now. There's no one on her level. And what she did on Saturday was not only make history for women's MMA, she made history for MMA, period, because there have been double champions, meaning two, you know, a guy holds two belts at the same time, but no one has ever successfully defended both of those belts at the same time. So she's fighting at 135 and 145, like one fight, 135, 145, 135, and that's impressive. No one's ever done that. Connor didn't do it. Cormier didn't do it. Um, Henry Cejudo didn't do it. And so she made history being the first one. She's expecting a child in September. She's not pregnant. Her partner is pregnant. And uh, she's going to take some time off. And, and usually that's not a good thing for the UFC, but in this case it might be a good thing because that will allow other contenders, I think, to form a queue and, and emerge and evolve. Hopefully they can find someone. If, if you're a hardcore fan out there and you're looking for a name right here and now, I think the next best opponent is someone named Irene Aldana who comes from Mexico. She's a great striker. Not quite sure she's on Amanda's level, but if they need a body, she's probably the most deserving for her next fight. Ariel Hawani, a few more minutes left with him from ESPN, the host of Ariel Hawani's MMA show, Ariel and the Bad Guy, DC and Hawani. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I do want to talk to you as opposed to just read off your list of all the things that you do. <laughs> Should we? Uh, what? All right. I'll just come straight through the front door. We're all looking at all sports that are operating in COVID-19 to see how they are handling COVID-19 and testing for it. Has nobody popped since these two fights? There's now two fights. We haven't heard anything about any of these fighters testing positive for COVID because they were on top of each other, fighting and, and, and breathing on each other and sweating on each other. Do we know anything about this, Ariel? So since, you know, since the pandemic, you know, really started here in America, they've held now five events. Prior to the first one on May 9th, yes. someone popped before the event. That's correct. Uh, Jacare Souza and his two cornermen. 
since then, no one has had to be removed from a fight because of testing positive. Now, uh, there was a situation that happened last Thursday where one of the fighters who was scheduled to compete on Saturday named Ian Heinish, uh, one of his cornermen, they said, had a false positive. And for like five hours, he was actually removed from the fight because he was in contact with that guy. But then they tested him again. And like four hours later, they got the results. I don't know how they got the results so quickly. And they said, no, it was a false positive. The guy is good to go. He actually tested negative. Other than that, we haven't heard uh, of anyone else testing positive. Now, you know, I'm surprised just because these guys have been training the whole time and they're they're all on top of each other, touching each other and all that stuff. And let's be honest, fighters sometimes aren't the most hygienic, you know, individuals uh, out there. But the one thing that they're not doing, look, I think they're doing a good job now going into the fights. They're testing them twice, once when they check in, once on Friday before the fight, and then they have to self-isolate. They're not testing them after the fight, when they go back into the real world. And I would love to know why that is. Uh, they just say, okay, we're just you know responsible leading up, and then it's, it's on them. And then what would happen if they actually did do that? So like on Sunday morning, if they made the guys get, you know, get that third test, and then we make sure, okay, everyone who's leaving this event in Las Vegas or wherever it may be is good to go 100% clean. I would love if they did that one more thing, but they're not doing that. So we don't really, and, and the fighters aren't really going to offer up that, that information. So we're not really hearing what's happening after the fact. And uh, that to me is, is the biggest thing that's kind of left to, to check off on that, on that list of things to do. Okay, Ariel, are we going to see a, a, a DC Stipe uh, Miocic fight? We're going to get that trilogy. What do you think? Yeah. Your boy DC? I think we're going to see it in August. Uh, and I think it will be great. It's, it's the fight to make. Um, and we've been wanting to see it for a a long time. So I think we'll see it in August, and uh, and that that should be, if if DC is telling me the truth, and he usually does, that will be his last fight ever. That will be his retirement fight. So what a way to go out. I love that guy. I love Daniel Cormier. He's the best. He sure is. He really, really really is. Uh, On the opposite side of of not being the best, um, has your Knicks fandom still not been knocked (laughs) out of you by uh, the worst owner in sports? Ariel, I mean, are you still are you still sticking around with the Knicks? The only team, the only team, Ariel, that has yeah. not made a statement at all about George Floyd. None, zero point zero. Full yeah. blue Tarski. <laughs> only team in the National Basketball Association to not do anything publicly. I'm done, Rich. You are. I'm done. You are. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I did not I expect. Done, I did not expect you to. Submit. That was a How submission. I... I did not expect that yes. submission from Ariel. You tapped Hawaii. out. You tapped just out. tapped out. Yes. That's right. I tapped out. Welcome. Uh, Welcome I mean, to the club. Welcome. I'm done, Rich. I am done. I am done. I know this is music to your ears. Yes. But guess what? I can't. I mean, I, I can't support this, right? I, I can't. I can't support it. And those internal emails were disgraceful, laugh, laughable. I mean, look, all these corporate statements, for the most part, they're all shallow. They're all very hollow. But you kind of just feel at this point like, you got to do it because if you don't do it, you're the one dissenter. And, of course, it's the Knicks who are the one dissenter. And it's amazing when you have a leader like Greg Popovich who can speak from the heart and actually, you know, connect with people or Steve Kerr. I mean, those franchises are so lucky. The Knicks are in shambles. And I'm just I'm disappointed in what they've become because I remember them in the 90s. They were a model franchise. And I can't support that anymore. And if I'm being honest, part of the reason why it's easier for me to not support them right now is because, I don't know if you noticed, Rich, you know, we, we, I don't know if we've talked uh, since I've done it, maybe yeah. once or twice. I've been doing some sideline reporting for I the know NBA, that. so I can't be a fanboy. Oh. I can't. Uh, it's easier for me to take off that <laughs> He's a professional. Ariel, Ariel. I'm a professional, damn it. <laughs> Ariel, just let's, let's understand this. You know, you're going to be doing ESPN sideline stuff. How many times the Knicks on national television anyway? Come on now. That's right. It's very easy. You know what I mean? Like you could still, you could still do both. You could still do both. I come here every day. I can talk about the Yankees, and everyone knows that I'm a diehard fan of the Yankees. And I can, I can Chris Brockman look uh, Chris Brockman in, in, in the face. He's a big Red Sox guy. I can look him in the face yeah. and and have a normal conversation. Ish. Certainly, no, no, no. Uh, we could bring up Aaron Boone anytime we want here on the show because oh, wow. I have the microphone yeah. in front of me. Yeah. You know. No, but I'm serious, Ariel. I'm, 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 I'm. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. I know that it's kind of sad though. It, it makes me a little sad because because uh, you're such a you're such a diehard Nick fan. So you're going to go, you know, yeah. get your kids rooting for Durant and Kyrie and go to Brooklyn. Do that. You'll be uh, fine. I don't know about that. I mean, <laughs> lest we forget, my friend, lest we forget yes. that the reigning defending NBA champion from, your native, yes. from my home country of yes. Canada. Right. Yes. So this is a very easy fix. 
this is a very easy fix. But at the end of the day, and I get your 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 example and your analogy, but I don't like. Eventually, I'm going to be at the NBA Finals doing sideline interviews. Why not me? Why not me, Rich? Why? And so I can't. I can't have some coach who you know. Let's say it's I don't know. Uh, let's say it's the Pacers or the Nets in yes. the finals at that point. Yes. I can't have them say like, "Oh, you're a Knicks guy. You're not going to ask me good questions." No, I have to be a pillar of journalism. I have to be unbiased, and I can't have any preconceived notions attached to me because when I'm going to waltz mm, in there, I don't the game this. is going to change. This one I don't buy. I could totally. I appreciate. I appreciate you having a principled stand and telling the Knicks to go pound sand. The Knicks will never be in the NBA Finals. Don't worry about it. And nobody really cares. <laughs> nobody cares about the fact that the Knicks. And you are so tight that the Pacers coach won't listen to you. Nobody, nobody in the Eastern Conference. They, they, they know that they don't care. You know what I mean? Well, it really died. It, I've been holding out these last few years. It's amazing. But- 100% the darkest day in the history of the Knicks franchise is when they dragged Charles so, Oakley, Oakley that's out of that arena. That's when I, had, that's, that's when I yeah. finally put my, uh, my, my foot down. But, hey, listen, Ariel, uh, keep crushing it and doing what you're doing. Um, you are the best at what you do, and I appreciate when you answer our call. Thank you. Thank you. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you, Rich. You got All it. the best to you guys, and say hello to Josh for me. I will do that. There you go. Hey, bud.